All right, so I'm going to call this section Field Extension Rambling. And so I'm assuming that you've looked at most of the chapters on field extensions, and I don't want to necessarily revisit all of them. I just want to sort of chug through some examples, sort of give some broad ideas to alleviate any confusion that might be going on. So just like this isn't, don't think of this as lecture notes, it's just me discussing some ideas. So we're going to start with a really simple field that we know about, the field Q. It's a great field to start with. It's simple. We all understand it. It's rational numbers. Um, can't really go any simpler because the integers, for example, are not a field. And, and so you know there are other smaller fields, but Q is a great place because we all sort of know what's going on. So I'm going to take a polynomial in Q that doesn't have a root. So all right, the polynomial is really in Q of x. We have x squared minus 2, which has no root in Q. However, like we know that Q is contained in the real numbers, and in the real numbers there are a root. Now, in order to say that statement, I have to know about the real numbers to begin with, right? Which we do because these are sort of this common landscape that we know. Right? So we can say in this case, however, Q is contained in R. R in this case is a bigger field. And in R, x squared has minus 2 has a root. It has two of them, in fact, right? x is plus or minus root 2. Now, there's a question here. Before we look at the next example is, um, did we really need to go all the way to R? Right, like in other words, um, let's say from Q to R. Like, could we have got a bit bigger than Q, but like not all the way, right? So in other words, is there some, um, let's say, Q contained in E, contained in R, and let's say not equal to, in which case with a root in here. Because right, that's sort of maybe doing a better job, right? Like we don't have a root in Q, so we're like, hell, go all the way to R. To R. And we might be saying to ourselves, like, well, could I could have just got a bit bigger and not get everything? So there's a definition here, and then there's a looming question, of course, is um, right. we can define Q parentheses root 2 to be the smallest subfield of R containing Q and containing square root of 2. So this is sort of the ideal thing. It's sort of like, I say like, well, I'm gonna take you and I'm gonna put in the square root of two and I'm gonna put in as much as is necessary, or rather, let me rephrase it, put in as little as is necessary in order to still make it a field. Now it is unclear at this point whether this picks up all of R, right? Like, how does this compare to R? We, we know that it's bigger than Q because it's got the square root of 2 in it. But um, maybe when we pick up the square root of 2, we pick up everything else. Right? So then we have a theorem that says something about this, which we'll get to in a, in a few minutes. But this is a sort of idea here is that we could, we could certainly, when we're in this familiar landscape, we can go to a bigger field like R. Um, but maybe we don't want to go that big. We want to find sort of some intermediate thing. Right? Now, let me backtrack for a second. Um, and go back to the to a slightly different polynomial. So this question will revisit the one at the, the bottom. Right? So now consider x squared plus two, which is also in Q adjoined x. Also no roots in Q. But now going to R isn't good enough.
But again, we know, like this is familiar landscape. Q is contained in R. We can get bigger to see. I don't need the R in there, but it helps us sort of see like we're getting to an even bigger field. And in C, x squared plus 2 has a root. And we can use x's plus or minus i square root of 2 or square root of 2i or square root of negative 2. You, know, you can write a bunch of different ways. Whatever makes sense for you. It doesn't really matter. Uh, but we can still ask the same question. We could say, like, well, did we need to go all the way to C? Right, did we need to go all the way from Q to C? So we can have again, we can have this definition, which is unclear necessarily right now what we actually get. All right, we can say Q of the square root of negative two. This is the smallest. Subfield of C containing uh, Q and uh, square root of negative two. Then, of course, there's the same looming question: How does uh, Q join the square root of negative two? So that's sloppily written there. Um, let me write that a bit bigger, a bit better. Square root of negative two. How does this compare to to C? Well, presumably, we'd like it to be smaller. We'd like it to be like an intermediate feel. But right now, like as I write this on the paper, that's not clear. We have a theorem which is going to elaborate. But before we talk about that theorem. Um, we talk about sort of where that theorem comes from. So the key thing to see on this page is that in, in both of these cases, we, are, we preemptively know about a bigger field in which there's a root. And so what we can do is we can sort of scoop up that root. Uh, we can either move to that massive field, like R on the left and C on the right, or we could be like, well, let me just pick up a root and as much else as is necessary. And, uh, and maybe that's a little bit better. But there are some cases in which this doesn't work. So let me clear the screen and look at one of those cases. So now consider uh, an example like um, let's z5. That's our base field. That's replacing q. So now let's take the polynomial x squared plus x plus 1 in z5x. So this has no roots in Z5. And you can check this simply by plugging everything in, right? If you plug in zero, you get one. If you plug in one, you get three. If you plug in two, you get seven, which is two. If you plug in three, we get 13, which is three. If I did my math right. If you plug in four, we get 21, which is one. So there are no roots, right? Like we can try them all. But in this case, like we can't do the same thing, right? Like we, we don't know about any obvious extension. Right? We don't know any Z5 contained in something where there's a root. Right? We're, like we can't do things like so you might be tempted to be like, well, isn't Z5 contained in you know, R, for example? And the answer is like, no, because like in this case, it's not a subfield, right? So the reason not a subfield is because these have different operations, right? So Z5 is, is a mod five and R is not, this is not a subfield. Or if you prefer, R is not an extension field, right? So I can't just go to R and scoop up a root of x squared plus x plus one and like dump it in with z5. It doesn't work because I'm not 
Okay, I don't have that root available. I don't have that extension available. So what can we do in this case? So this is where this big theorem comes up. There are a few theorems related to this, but they sort of all give the same kind of interconnectivity, right? And so the theorem basically says the following. It says, hey, look, you don't need to know a big, about a bigger field, right? Like, you don't need to preemptively know about a bigger field. The idea of the theorem is you can build a bigger field automatically um, just knowing about the base field. And in that bigger field, you will have a root and you don't need to have any preemptive knowledge about what's going on, right? So, so starting, and the way it works is this, if we're starting with a field F and a polynomial, let's say P of X, which is irreducible over F, it'll just be sort of um, like a given to begin with, I mean, so, um, we can construct the extension field fx mod the ideal generator of a p of x. And um, this is an extension of f, sort of, right? So this is where things can get a bit weird, but we'll talk about that in a second. Um, but we'll say in this extension field, P of x absolutely has a root and tells you exactly what that is. That root is the coset because remember this um, quotient ring is a bunch of cosets here. And these are cosets and they're cosets of the form um, f of x plus the ideal generator by p of x such that p of x is in big F adjoined x. That is exactly what that quotient ring looks like. So in that quotient ring, the root is the coset x plus p of x. Now, this is where I need to make an important point because this is often a source of confusion, is that it's a bit of a lie. Let me underline something up here when it says we can construct the extension field. This is, I'm gonna put lie in quotes. So the reason is that um, it's not really an extension field of F, right? Like we're claiming it's an extension field of F. It's not really. What it is is that inside this new field, there is an isomorphic copy of F, right? So this thing that we're claiming is an extension, I'll give you an example in a second, is not really an extension field of F, although we use the term anyway, right? What's really happening is that um, is that um, uh, this new ring, this new field rather, contains a sort of an isomorphic copy of F. So just to clarify, let me sort of explain this in, um, in the abstract and then we can look at a specific example. So the isomorphic copy of F is, Inside this quotient ring, right, we have the set of all cosets that look like this. Okay. Things that look like A plus the ideal generator by P of X. This is isomorphic to F. Because right, F is just a bunch of A's and all I'm doing is adding the coset on. So it's basically a copy, an isomorphic copy of F. This is honestly a subfield, like honestly, truly, and accurately a subfield of this new quotient field. Right? So F itself is not a subfield, but this isomorphic copy is. Right? This is a copy of F. 
which is inside the quotient link, a uh, quotient field. So uh, let me give you an example where we can talk a little bit more about this. And I'll go back to Q of X before we revisit this, um, this Z5 example. Let's take a trip back to uh, Q and the polynomial x squared minus two. So now we pretend we know nothing about R. Let's say pretend R and C and don't exist. Like we don't know anything about them. Now they're gonna come back in a second um, because we're gonna ask this question after the theorem applies. But for right now, pretend like you don't know anything about the real numbers or the complex numbers. So the theorem says, oh, we don't care. It says the theorem says that we can build Q adjoined x mod the ideal joined by x squared minus two. And in this field, in this extension field, x squared minus two does have a root. So then you can ask this question. You can be like, what, for example, so there are a few things we can ask here, right? So let's sort of go down a few avenues. Um, question, just so we're clear, what do elements in this extension field look like? So this being this guy here. So the answer is, you can answer this a few different ways. We can say, well, it's the set. Let me write this. We could say, well, formally, it's the set of uh, f of x plus the ideal generated by x squared minus two, where f of x is in q adjoin x. Right? So that's sort of a really crude way of putting it. We could say some examples of things would be like um, two x plus three plus the ideal generated by x plus two. We could say four x plus the ideal generated by x squared, plus, um, sorry, minus two in this case. both cases. And then you could say something like, well, what about um, x squared plus the ideal gender by x squared minus two? And that's also in there. However, that's the same as negative two, or positive two rather, plus the ideal gender by x squared minus two. This is because x squared minus two plus the ideal generated by x squared minus two is the same as zero plus the ideal generator by x squared minus two. This is a property of cosets. Right? So you can add a two to and add a two plus the ideal to both sides. And, and you can see that, that this statement right here is true. And this follows immediately from here. And so you can start to see that you can simplify these elements a bit. You know, for example, if you said, well, what about x cubed plus x plus x squared minus two? Well, we know that x squared this is like x times x squared plus x plus the ideal. And um, we know that x squared is basically the same as two. So really this is a three x plus the ideal. So we can see that what's happening here, so I keep writing plus two out of sloppiness, these are all minuses. That, um, that you know any power greater than or equal to x squared will sort of vanish. It'll fall, not vanish, but sort of falls into the calculation. So, you know, we can start to see like, well, okay, so in fact, all elements will look like, like ax plus b plus the ideal. Where a and b are in q because everything of a higher power so that's a bit sloppy right there everything of a higher power can be reduced in this case now um but again they're not you know we're not necessarily saying that uh you know that they that they're easy to understand that it's easy to understand how these 
elements in this field behave. So that sort of leads us, actually sort of like, while we're at it, let me just talk about how Q is a subfield of this. So again, to reiterate, Q itself is not, is not really a subfield. But we do have the subfield um, consisting of things that just look like B plus the, plus the ideal. And this subfield basically looks like Q. It's an isomorphic copy of Q. inside the quotient field. And then a uh, second question we can ask, which just came up is um, like the claim from the theorem was that in this extension field, x squared minus two, right? So uh, x squared minus, so in this extension field, sorry, um, that x squared minus two has a root, right? So then we could ask ourselves, like, what is the root of the x squared minus 2 in this extension field? And the answer to this is, like, well, the theorem says what it is. The theorem says it is specifically this element, x plus the ideal generated by p of x. So I just want to point out how does this work. How can we see this? So the answer is, it's a bit confusing. Oh, it's notationally weird. So let me clear the screen and explain what I mean by notationally weird because um, it's worth walking through this notation just once and then sort of just so we see it and accept it. And, um, and then it'll sort of make more sense like what's going on as we move forward and, um, or, or even why like we want to look at this in the abstract more all right so let's see why so here we here's the reason the notation is weird so the polynomial we're looking at Is uh, x squared minus two, right? and this is in Q adjoined x. But when we extended Q to Q, uh, I'm going to put a quotes around that because when we extended it, we sort of built a bigger field in which there's an isomorphic subfield. There's a subfield isomorphic to Q, and so. When we did this, constants in Q became cosets under this sort of idea. Right? So when we do this, so uh, let's say elements in Q become cosets like we just saw on the previous screen that look like this. So it's not that's a bracket it's supposed to be that. Clean that up a bit. So this is what's really happening, right? The, the polynomial is, we're no longer really treating it in Q adjoined x, right? So x squared minus two uh, is now really this is going to look terrible, but it's worth writing down just for the giggles. It's really in this polynomial field. So um, I could think of it like this. We could write the polynomial as x squared, because the two is not really a two anymore in the bigger field. It's really a um, two plus the ideal generated by x squared minus two. But this is really icky. The reason is that like I have x's in different places. So the, um, the double use of x is confusing. 
So typically what can help here is um, if we treat the polynomial and the variable, the, the rather the variable and the polynomial, we use a different letter. Right, so let's say, let's use a different letter. For the, for the uh, polynomial, like z, is typically what I'll use. So now the polynomial is really, we could think of it as z squared minus 2 plus x squared minus 2. This kind of makes sense because in this case, my coefficients, right, so it's also worth noting there's a 1 here, which is really. That's an error, a terrible error. This is really this guy. So if you want to be really pedantic, right, you could write something like uh, 1 plus the ideal generated by x squared minus 2 z squared plus, oh, sorry, minus, keep doing that, 2 plus the ideal generated by x squared minus 2. This is really the polynomial, right? It's a polynomial, the coefficients are rational numbers in the sense that they're the copy they're rational numbers that sit in the isomorphic copy of the rational numbers that are in the the quotient ring quotient field that we just built and now at this point we can really see that the coset x plus the ideal is a root because if we plug it in this is what happens i'm going to keep this one here just for fun. So if I plug in this coset, right, so when I square it, remember how cosets work, so this becomes an x squared plus the ideal, multiply by 1 plus the ideal, this is x squared, this is left hand part, is this, the right hand part is this, Combine these. And then this is zero. Now, this also lets us see that we can actually factor this polynomial in this new field. So let me write that just across the bottom, right? So this polynomial, I'm going to refrain from writing the uh, the coefficient of z. This polynomial actually factors, right? So the fact that let me circle something here on the screen. The fact that um, that x squared plus the ideal is a root means that z minus that is a factor. That's a factor that turns out the other factor is the plus version. Now, if you multiply those out, if you foil those, you'll see what happens. Got to get a z squared at the beginning, and then at the for the the middle terms cancel, and for the the, the last terms, I get x squared plus the ideal, and x squared plus the ideal is the same as. Um, 2 plus the ideal. And so then we get z minus 2 plus the ideal, which is exactly that. So we factored it, right? So now in all of this example, we might then re reflect back and say like, well, how did this compare to the to just dumping a square root of 2 into q when we knew about c, right? Like, like is this the same, right? So it turns out the theorem actually says like, yeah, these are isomorphic as fields. So let me just show you what's really going on there. So there's this question here is how do these two relate? So this guy, this original guy that was felt really appealing. Right, where we in the left in this one we have to know about 
R ahead of time. And in the construction that we've now done, we don't need to know about R ahead of time. Right? So the answer is, the theorem tells us, they're isomorphic. Now, we can sort of see this like intuitively. So like we could look at some examples of calculations. Like we can write down a mapping, absolutely. But and that's fine, but sometimes looking at some calculation examples can really, really help. So um, the way to see it with the isomorphism though is that in here, in this guy, let me rewrite these both. In fact, let me write the isomorphism and then I'll uh is that over in the left hand side the square root of 2 is a special element. It's the thing we have to add on. Over on the right hand side, there's this special coset. The reason each of these are special is on the left hand side, square root of 2 is the root. And on the right hand side, the coset is the root. So they're behaving very similar in that regard. Right? Now, here's some calculations. So over on the left, if I take the square root of 2 and I square it, I get 2. Over on the right hand side, if I take x plus the ideal and I square it, I get x squared plus the ideal, which is 2 plus the ideal. So we're like a little bit, looks similar, right? In both cases I get 2. On the left hand side I just get 2, the right hand side I get two in the isomorphic copy of Q that exists in the, um, in the extension field. Uh, we have, on the left hand side, we have the factorization, right? We have X, let's write it this way. Let me write on um, the original polynomial is X minus square root of two, X plus square root of two. In the right hand side, we have the polynomial, which I'm gonna rewrite with a Z as z minus x plus the ideal and z plus x plus the ideal. So in both cases, right, like you can see, let me underline some stuff here. It's the square root of two and the x plus the ideal. Those are, those are sort of um, playing similar roles all over the place. because that's really what's going on with the isomorphism. And then the other thing to mention before we go back and look at weird, weirder example is that, or back to the Z5 example, is that this also helps us see what Q parentheses root two looks like. Actually, let me do one more calculation really quickly. Just so we're convinced that this all works even um, sort of without necessarily looking at, uh, at like the really simple example. So here's just another calculation like suppose in Q times the square root of 2 I do something like or Q parentheses square root of 2 I do something like um, 1 plus the square root of 2 times say 3 minus 2 times the square root of 2. This is, um, this is in uh, Q parentheses root two, because it'll take up some space, right? So this is not a hard calculation, right? These are just um, real numbers. So I need to FOIL it because it's sort of icky. So first I get a three, the outer I get a minus two root two, the inner I get a plus three root two, and the last we get a minus two times two, which is four. So I get um, three minus four is negative one plus square root of two. Uh, if I do the same, so the analogous con calculation, computation, if you like, All right, what would I need to do? What's well, a bit ickier, right? So the one plus the square root of two, this is now really the, the ideal one plus, I'm gonna write just bracket for the ideal for a second, plus the square root of two. Square root of two, the analogy for that was x plus the ideal. 
right? So let me underline some stuff. Let me color code some, some crap as we go. This guy is, the, the isomorphic analogy is this guy right here. So for the next one, the three, a three is really like the three plus the ideal. And the um, two root two is minus two, Uh, let me just write the ideal, I'm not writing anything inside it. So the analogy for the, the other part is uh, that this, the isomorphic analogy is this. Now, when we multiply those, all this stuff right here. So now we need to foil those, right? So it's still, it's a messy foil job, but let's write it all out. So when I foil the first two, I get one plus the ideal times three plus the ideal is three plus the ideal. When I do the outer, I get negative two times the ideal times one plus the ideal. So this is negative two times the ideal. And then we do the inner, I get x plus the ideal times three plus the ideal, which is plus three times the ideal. And when I do the last ones, we get negative two times the ideal squared. So for right now, I'm just gonna write this. So this is the FOIL result. Now, when we simplify this, if we look at the ending, this part right here, that's x squared plus the ideal, which is two plus the ideal. So altogether, this is minus four times the ideal or four plus the ideal. So we combine all this, I get three plus the ideal minus four plus the ideal, which is minus one plus the ideal. I get negative two times x plus the ideal plus three times x plus the ideal, which is plus one times x plus the ideal which we can rewrite if we like as um, x minus one plus the ideal. Now, um, it might be better to leave it in the original form because what we see here is that this guy right here, this is sort of like, let me just go bam right up to here, that's like that. And this right here, that's our root again, right there. So we can see we did the same calculation in two different contexts, which is why we have this isomorphism between these two things, right? But of course, you know, in, in, in the abstract in general, like, all right, let me rephrase it. This, this, isomorphism only, this isomorphism only exists because we have this, you know, this, um, let me circle it, because we have this Q root two to even talk about. Like in cases where we don't have a bigger field to talk about, this doesn't really work, right? So let me go back to that um, C5 example. Let's go back to C5 and the polynomial, the irreducible polynomial, x squared plus x plus one, right? So like there's no such thing, like we cannot do like this. Uh, whatever, like we can't, but like it's not clear what a root is right now. Uh, because there's no, we have no obvious C5 is contained in something. Right? Now we can still, of course, do this. This is the beauty of the method is that the method says like it doesn't matter if you, if you don't have an extension field handy like you build one right so like here we go we built one bam right? and in this uh, x plus the ideal is a root again just to make sure it's clear with the notation is a bit icky right it's formally A root of so I'm going to rewrite the polynomial as z squared plus z 
plus one, and one looks like this. And again, you can see it by plugging it in, by plugging it in. And I say like, okay, well, let's plug it in, right? X plus the ideal. I'm plugging this in for Z plus X plus the ideal. one plus the ideal at this point you can probably see like well obviously it's it's going to work every time because we're the point is that we're custom designing this extension field so that it works so I get x squared plus x plus one plus the ideal and that's zero plus the ideal So it definitely works, but of course, you know, there's nothing else we can say it's isomorphic to. Like we can't do these parallel calculations um, because you know it doesn't. Like, we don't have this parallel for which to, to to see. Right now, it turns out, however, because you might be then left to say, well, look, I mean, is this the only way we we could extend z5 to pick up a root? Right, and the answer is like, well, I mean. This is an abstract method, so there are other abstract methods, but the point is that they'll always be the same. That um, if we could find another smallest extension field in which um, x squared plus x squared plus one had a root. Well, this is sort of I'm sort of saying this sloppily. Um, root in a similar way. It would be isomorphic. So sort of said that's kind of I don't want to say it's half inaccurate, but I've sort of said that badly, and I don't want to dig too far deeply into the uh, the technical details here. The point is that because this is going to segue into the whole splitting field idea, which I didn't want to go to in this little ramble here right now, so I won't. But the point is that, like, that the key point of all of this is there is always an extension field. Uh, we can always extend, um, let's say, uh, F to pick up to 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 uh to a lot to um that's awkward. we can always extend f to an extension field in which there's a root now just as a closing note i want to go back to the uh the case where we where we do know about the other example just to sort of say that this finally also answers another question that we have which is what do the elements of the original thing look like so let me give you an example so we have a context a little sort of final note for this ramble at least is uh and we also let's say know what are the elements in F adjoined A look like. Let's say in the case where we do have, like this is sort of think of the Q root 2 case, right? In that case, we had this isomorphism, right? The theorem the theorem gave us the thing on the right, and we had the thing on the left. So this is n like not the Z5 case, but yes, the Q case. Right? In this case, we have this isomorphism, and the theorem then tells us that the elements in this actually all look like, say, so look like um, A sub N. Uh, sorry, I'm gonna, let me not use A there. They use that, uh, they look like, like, let's say, let me do it this way, C sub zero plus C sub one A plus C sub two A squared up to C sub 
n minus 1 a to the n minus 1, where n is the degree of p of x. Now, if this seems like awfully like a big mouthful, let me just give you two examples. So, in back to this case, this case that we know and love, right? we know that these are isomorphic. We sort of hopefully have a pretty good idea of what's going on now in each in either case. And what this says is elements in here, right? The degree of this polynomial is two, right? This is this polynomial. So elements in Q square root of two look like uh, C zero plus C one square root of two. Period. That's it. They don't need to get any more complicated. They all look like this. Right? Versus if we did something like maybe um, say the cube root of two. Right? This is isomorphic. Right? Like this in the left hand side we're just extending to the real numbers. Um, we're picking up the cube root of two and anything else that's necessary to make it a field. If we had done it using the theorem I would have that. X cubed minus two here. The degree P of x in this case is 3, so elements in q root of 2 look like c0 plus c1 square root of 2 plus uh, q root of 2 rather plus c2 cube root of 2 squared. So basically just up to but not including the, the degree of the polynomial that gets it done. And again, this doesn't apply in the Z5 case. Right? And again, the reason, just to reiterate, is right, we don't have something over here. Right? I'm not saying that there aren't possibilities, but there's no obvious possibility of the way that we've written the things as before. So there's like there's no analogy here. Like I can't talk about the Z root z5 parentheses something like that's meaningless gibberish without this bigger extension field so let me pause that because i think i've rambled for about 50 minutes now hopefully some of these ideas help you um you know understand what the heck is going on with these field extensions